Coming up on this week's Fast TV, we're in Dumfries visiting SRUC's Barney College to hear from Head Shepherd Perry Parkinson about the changes he has made to the sheep flock to improve efficiencies. And we visit Crawford Niven in Perthshire to hear about how he is using social media and his YouTube channel Crawford's Farm to promote the agricultural industry. Perry Parkinson is head shepherd at SRUC's Barony College near Dumfries. Perry is a passionate young sheep farmer who was selected to be involved in the 2022 National Sheep Association's Next Generation Ambassador Programme. Perry is not afraid to try new ideas and has switched to composite breeds to improve efficiencies and reduce input costs. Hello, I am Perry Parkinson. I'm shepherd here at the Barony Farm. This is Steam Muir, it's one of, one of our sort of least blocks that we run most of our sheep on. Uh, currently running the sheep on 56 hectares, roughly about, and yeah, running a sort of multitude of three different flocks, which is obviously Dorsets, Highlanders, and Scotch Mules. So just over two and a half years ago, I just went self-employed after leaving a job that was starting to sort of sell up and, and reduce stock quite significantly. Uh, George Bakey, our director, he approached me and said that this job was coming up. Um, I'm a SEC graduate myself back in 2015 up at Ockencrove, so it's sort of nice just to fall back into that, that same company and fall back into the same way of things. So sheep enterprise wise, when I first arrived back in be 2021 now, we had 500 Scotch North of England mules uh, going to the Texel of Suffolk for early lambing in February, March. And just as I arrived, we had 50 Dorset hogs as well, which were getting kept pure. Since then, we've reduce the mule numbers down to about 280, soon to go to 250 so we can lamb them all on the one shed. Sort of kept the same Dorset numbers but sort of try to concentrate more on self-replacing and quality over quantity. And then lastly we've got the Highlanders that we've got from down south in Devon. They're obviously an innovous, innovous breed and currently we're sat at sort of 250, 260 but hopefully we're self-replacing now anyway after the last two years and we are sort of aiming to increase them and, and keep the mules down at, at 250. A composite breed is basically, almost, I don't want to say a mongrel or a mutt, but it's sort of that, that way inclined. It's a mixture of breeds, almost like a hybrid breed that you combine three or four different breeds, you know, depending on certain traits, mix them all together and come up with this composite crossbreed that sort of suits a lot of factors with regards to obviously whatever traits they're carrying for that system, whether it's maternal or terminal. Yeah, so the benefits, well, we'll go with the Highlanders, seeing as they're here anyway. The benefits of our Highlander, which is a composite breed, they're a lot more prolific for a start. We're scanned at 218%. The fertility seems to be a lot better with them. We seem to be scanning, obviously, 218%, but then at top in time, sort of into the second cycle, you're only really sort of left with 4 or 5% that needs to be topped. Everything's pretty much lambing, but 96, 97% is lambing in the first two cycles, which I think is pretty, pretty decent for what they are. Very, very milky. Obviously, with a scan of 218, you get quite a lot of triplets, but they seem to be, you know, sort of 80, 90% of them are rearing triplets. Um, we might get a smaller lamb in the back end, but we still manage to sell it at a, at a really good profit. And just, like I said, the mothering ability is, is the main thing for us. Obviously, because I lamb them outside, we have to tag and record at birth. So the fact that I can walk up to a set of newborn lambs, stand there and scan the eye with the Zion as I'm tagging the lambs is almost unheard of like so it's you know that is one of the main sort of benefits that that we do see and obviously the efficiency side you know we're not we're not feeding any concentrate it's grass all year round soon to go into a stubble stubble turnip for the winter this year as a trial and for the last two years that we've had them we've never wormed or fluked them yet so that's obviously as part of fec pack which we're using as well to test regularly you know coinciding with that it is showing a lot of benefits yeah last year or the year before in the winter sorry i was lucky enough to be awarded a NSA Young Ambassador title, I suppose it was. Everyone applied through the UK and there was 12 of us that were selected. There was me and a friend of mine, Karen, from Scotland, and the rest were all English or Welsh. So there was 12 of us, and sort of over the course of a year, every month or two months, we'd have a series of sort of workshops where we'd meet, you know, sort of industry people or MPs or anything, to sort of, you know, farmers who are doing different things, whether it comes to herbal lays or whether it was, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of new first time tenants on farms, things like that. So, and yeah, sort of through all those workshops, they're all tailor made to exactly what we were sort of either doing or want to do in the future ourselves. And yeah, it just, we've, we've finished it now after the year. Um, but yeah, it's sort of, it's 
introduced us to a whole sort of new scope of a whole new circle of people which has sort of benefited a lot of us already. Improving grass at the barony is important for increasing efficiencies and performance in the sheep enterprise. So at the minute it's a bit of a mixture, a bit of a, a mess up on the weekend, obviously everything got mixed up but this should just be our sort of February, March born um, Abermax mule lambs. Um, we're sort of yeah, 250 away so far, probably about another 150, 200 to go. So the weights, because of the lamb price, we're just trying to get that little bit more weight and flesh on them. Obviously the drought hasn't helped either with the, the fleshiness. So, but yeah, we just, the field that they're in, we, we stitched, it was getting a bit tired last year. So we stitched the rejuvenation mix in from Watson Seeds. We just stitched it straight in the back end, sort of September, October time, just sort of incorporating a lot more sort of clover and a bit more sort of Italian, um, Italian and perennial in there just to sort of give us a bit more power, a bit more life. So you can sort of see it now that the drought's finally passed, it is starting to come back now and it is actually looking really, really nice. So yeah, we, we wormed them, um, we tested with Fecpac, they had a little bit of nematodirus, wormed them on a different paddock and once they were clear, chucked them on there, put them behind a really, really nice straight electric fence. And yeah, just about another day in here and then we'll, we'll shift, the, shift the wire, get them on a fresh break and then next week we'll run them back through, weigh them, and then take another draw of lambs. Here at the Barony, we take three cuts of silage. Uh, generally, if we could get four, we'll take four, like over at the Crichton. This year is obviously a bit different because of the cooler spring. We're sort of a little bit later, and obviously the drought hasn't helped either. So we've just got second cut in, which was baled. Usually, majority of it will all be pit, as much as long as we've got the space. Um, obviously, that varies year on year. So um, yeah, so it's generally pit. We've got bales at the minute for second cut. Third cut will probably follow the same way. Over here at Stamia with the grazing block, if we try and manage it obviously with electric fences as much as we can, we mob stock as well. So obviously now that all of the, the lambs are weaned off the mules and the highlanders, it's sort of, you know, three different mob stocks as it were. So they're all sort of, as you can sort of see, the lambs are obviously here behind a fence. And then to the left of us, we've got highlander lambs that are freshly weaned. And then we've got the highlander yows down there that are mob stocking, but they're sort of getting dried off. Obviously they were only weaned yesterday, so we're getting them dried off for the next week or so, and then they'll go into this nice fresh bite that we're in at the minute. So yeah, if anything gets, if anything looks like it's getting ahead of us, we'll just shut it off and we can bale that up and we can either use it for sheep at lambing time for baled silage in a, in a TMR, or it'll go into young stock or dairy cattle in the mixer wagon. We measure all the paddocks now. Um, we probably haven't done enough of it in the past, but this year we've, between sort of new management and and want to sort of make a better go of grassland management, we are starting to measure a lot more frequently. So that sort of typically falls onto a, my apprentice Yasmin at the minute. So yeah, sort of once a week, she'll go around and try and, you know, keep the same path through the field and same steps and try and keep it as accurate as possible. Perry is keen to develop his career and has useful advice for other farmers and crofters across Scotland. I think just having the, not, so, not letting other people, not letting all your neighbours sort of tell you that, it's a stupid idea and that you're wrong and that you know you can't make any money or your lambs look terrible and all that i think biting the bullet is probably the biggest one i think doing research and getting in touch with farmers obviously instagram is probably actually one of the best sort of tools for it now you know you do come across a lot of farmers a lot of sort of new entrants that are you know sort of either going the same way as what you want to be or what you are doing or or something slightly different that you've never seen and you know a lot of them are quite handy and just you know, you can pick their, you can message them, pick their brains, and that's how I've sort of worked the last couple of years. You know, seeing seeing different people doing different things, especially with sort of herbal lays and, and grass rotations, and obviously the Highlanders as well through Innovus. Um, people like Innovus, and you know, even SAC consultant themselves. Like, there's a lot of people out there who are quite happy in in giving you the figures and the facts. And I think that's what I'm trying to do here. Is you know, I'm trying to be that sort of test bunny for the UK if I can, and if I can, if I can go through the highs and lows and pump out a load of information at the end and facts and figures you know that are based on a real life farm we are a college and a research centre but we do run it I try and run it as much as a business as I can so I think yeah they're the sort of best tips I think I can I can give yeah ultimate goals I think that's anyone's any sort of farmer or farm workers goals to have their own farm I think in this sort of day and age I think it's nigh on impossible um but no I think at the minute I'm you know I am quite happy and settled here I think obviously SEC are quite good and give or SIUC are quite good and giving me as much sort of rope and scope as I need to sort of do things. They have allowed me to do, you know, sort of trial everything myself as it, you know, as it was sort of my own farm. So, but yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, if I can get a tenancy in the future or my own farm, where it was bought if I win the lottery, you know, um, I suppose that is the future plan. But I think for now, if I can just plod along here like I am and, 
you know, just get enough scope by SIUC to sort of give me the tools to, to try new things, then I'm, I'm quite happy. Social media is a great mechanism for promoting farming and crofting, selling farm and croft produce, and strengthening relationships between farmers and consumers. At Glogburn Farm near Perth, Crawford Niven farms alongside his brother and parents, running around 1,300 acres of cereal crops and livestock. Crawford is a well-known YouTuber in the farming sector and uses his channel, Crawford's Farm, to promote agriculture and inspire others into the sector. So on the farm, we grow a range of cereal crops, barley, winter barley, spring barley, winter oats, spring oats, oilseed rape, wheat. We also mix in peas, potatoes, carrots into the rotation. So we uh, rent out that ground to add to the rotation to kind of spread the years. Alongside that, we've put on a field of sunflowers and rye. So they're not as a traditional harvesting crop. They're more of a kind of agri-tourism side on the farm shop. So I've, I've grown up, always grown up on this farm. This is the house behind us. I live in there with my mom and dad. I went away to university after school. Um, I studied mechanical engineering, didn't really know what I was going to do and then I was coming out of uni at the same time as Covid was hitting. So one, I wasn't getting any jobs and two, I didn't want the jobs I was applying for and I kind of realised I actually really like it here. Always helped during the summers at harvest time, falling into it and yeah, really enjoy it, get on well. There's loads of room to do whatever we want. Dad's pretty loose and lets me carry out projects that I want to try myself as well. The farm shop side of things, that opened, we're coming up on the 20 year anniversary of that opening. So my brother, he had hens on the farm, sold eggs out of the garage next to the farmhouse. My mum made jams and chutneys and then mum decided she wanted a wee shop with a wee cafe and a restaurant. So that started a wee 10 by 10 square and it's slowly over the last 20 years growing different bits, whether it's butchery, deli, extended the cafe restaurant area and it's kind of multiplied over the years. So through the farm shop, various different kind of streams of produce. What we produce ourselves on the farm, we produce the beef side of things here. We also produce oats for in terms of porridge. We try and use all our own free range eggs on the farm. In the cafe, we sell that in the shop as eggs and we also deliver them locally. So that's kind of the basis around the shop is the eggs. Yeah, we try and keep as local as possible, Scottish produce in particular. Um, but as the shop's grown, obviously, there is a limited supply in this country, so we do have other things from the rest of the UK. But yeah, we try and source as much Sc Scottish produce as possible. In terms of the activities and whatnot going on, that's, a, that's definitely a growing side of the business as of the last two years. We started off with sunflowers, sowed a 10-acre block of sunflowers, and I went out with a lot more and cut a path into it. And these sunflowers grew. We nailed it the first year. They were six foot tall. They were bright yellow. They were great. And we flooded the field with families and we ended up blocking the roads actually. So it went really well. We had to kind of cut it short because we were blocking the roads. And that's, we've kind of realized it's a good route to go around. It gets people out into the countryside. We've got the fields for use. We've got the kit to sow the sunflowers. So we we'll now do that every year, one field of sunflowers. Last year, we had a map of Scotland cut into the sunflowers. This year, I've not decided exactly what we're going to do, but we'll figure out, we'll get a nice image. And then we've also now this year, for the first year, put on a field of rye. So I was looking for a crop that again, is that six foot tall um, height, and it makes it kind of enclosed and a nice place to be. I was drawing an image of Doddy Weir to try and raise a bit of money from my name's Doddy Foundation. On the YouTube side of things, I started this YouTube channel it's coming up, no, it's two years old about now. I started filming just what's going on in the farm, what I'm doing, because I also watched other people on YouTube doing that, and I've always kind of been keen on videography side of things and video and things that are going on and showing what happens on an actual farm. And it's got benefits to the business as well. It brings people out, people who are watching online, other farmers, they then see the farm shop, and oh, we'll go out for a cup of tea or we'll go and see what, so what it's like. So it has its benefits in that side of things, as well as working with machinery manufacturers. They're keen to get demos out to us. They're keen to do deals on bits of kit. So it has its benefits in that way. And yeah, I've really enjoyed doing it so far. The YouTube definitely gives us satisfaction or like you get a good response for what you're doing, good or bad. You learn a lot. Like I'll put things out on YouTube and I've, 
whether I do it the right way or the wrong way, that someone's got an opinion or whether it's helpful or not, sometimes it is really, really helpful. I'm trying to do a job or something's broken, say something on the tractor's broken down and I've no idea what's going on. I've got 16,000 people to ask. So I put this video up saying this is broken. Anyone got any ideas? And I do get a lot of farmers watching that have been through that problem or been through that issue and they offer advice. So it's great for that side of things. For now, it's farming base. I think the core of the YouTube needs to be the farming because that's what I do day in, day out. But I think in order to continue to grow and not kind of fade out, you do need to change the content and add different styles of things. Comparatively between these other YouTubers, I do always consciously think of the guys who are doing really well or are further ahead of me. Oh, I should do what they're doing. But then you just, you just become them. You just, and then it's almost less likely to watch you because they're already watching someone doing the same thing. So I actually try and block out what anyone else is doing and just do what I'm doing, do it well. And if people want to watch that, then great. And they might not get that elsewhere. Social media can be a great asset to your farming and crofting business. But many farmers feel nervous when sharing content about themselves and their farm online. What advice would Crawford give to others who may want to increase their own social media presence? And what advice does he have for those interested in pursuing a career in Scottish agriculture? I would say in terms of the confidence on the YouTube side of things, I mean, I was totally nervous when I first started doing it. I kind of made up a, a kind of dodgy video of, oh, what's going on here? And I showed mum and dad and my brother and sis, brothers and sisters, and they were all said it was great. And that kind of sparked like, okay, right, they find it not too bad and it's not too kind of cringe where they write I'll, I'll try it and crack on and i'd say in terms of someone else getting into it you just have to crack on and do it it's, you're never going to go boom like shoot to the stars immediately it took me ages to get to a thousand subscribers it's just a slow steady consistent pace and your first video is not going to be that good or your first post isn't going to be that good but just the more you do it, the repetitive nature of it. It's the same with everything. The more you do something, the better you get at it. Young people getting into the industry, I, I'm very, very fortunate in that my family have a family farm here and there's space for me to come and enter into the business. There's space for my brother. I've got sisters. If they ever wanted to come back, there's, there's ample room for them. So I'm really fortunate in that way. But others getting into it, I would say you don't necessarily need to be out in a field of cows to be a farmer there's so many routes you can be a mechanic you can work for yeah machinery companies you can go and be agronomist there's so many different avenues to farming there's not just crops and cows